this is actually my ninth visit here, uh, and I'm going to keep coming back until I get it right. Um, and it really is my home store, and it's the perfect uh, store uh, for this particular reading, and I'll explain in a second. We have uh, the Jewish uh, book serve, Jewish broadcasting service, JBS, and the great Mark Golub filming this. So uh, for the folks watching on cape cable, as well as online and the website and st streaming, the JBS is really an important uh, public service and they're it's very entertaining network. So I promise I won't let you down, it'll be fun. Um, and then I think I should acknowledge there is at least one person that flew up all the way from Miami Beach for this. Uh, Steve Bubba Cohen is back there. He flew up this day and the reason for that I think is because either, people from Miami Beach are very protective of the peninsula and they want to make sure I didn't screw it up. So uh, he's, he's here to watch over it. Um, <laughs> fact checking. Well, it's a, it's a novel, Bubba. It, there's nothing really that ever happened here. Um, uh, How Sweet It Is uh, takes place in uh, in 1972 in Miami Beach. Uh, for those of you who were alive in 1972, uh, it was a very momentous, iconic year. Uh, it was a year of uh, incredible uh, social, uh, racial unrest and political turmoil and social upheavals. It was the summer of um, the two political conventions that took place both in Miami Beach that summer. That was the first time that it, that had ever happened. It was the summer where uh, the counterculture was, had become more politically mobilized as part of the anti-war effort. Uh, it was the year that uh, desegregation was actually uh, 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 coming to, uh, was really being developed all throughout the United States in both the Northeast and then certainly in the Deep South, and you can't get more Deep South than Miami Beach. Um, and uh, uh, it was a, 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 an incredible political time. It was still during the Cold War, and uh, Fidel Castro, uh, was, it, which had who had an incredible effect on South Florida, it was became clear at that point that communism was going to remain in Cuba, and uh, and that uh, the hotels that used to be owned uh, by the Jewish mafia were gone forever. Um, and so into this tumultuous year. Uh, uh, there were a number of people uh, who actually lived, were existed in Miami Beach uh, at that time. Uh, people like Jackie Gleason and Frank Sinatra and uh, Muhammad Ali and Meyer Lansky um, and, uh, and, uh, and Isaac Besheva Singer, uh, um, among others. And the city at that time in 1972 was not the city that we know it today with uh, fashion models and power forwards <laughs> sipping margaritas uh, on the beach. It was, a, it was very much a city in decline in 1972 and it was a city screaming for a second chance. Uh, everybody of those characters were all looking for a second chance actually. Jackie Gleason had just lost his television show. Frank Sinatra had just retired for the first time. Um, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali was trying to regain his belt. Um, this was all at this very time. The only person who was on a roll, oh, Meyer Lansky, uh, at that point realized he was never getting the Capri, the Nacional, and the Riviera again. He wasn't getting those hotels back. And he very, and the Jewish mafia was very much in decline. And he very much wanted to see gambling come to Miami Beach, um, which is also a, a, a theme throughout this book. Um, and so the, the, everyone in this character, everyone in the book, that exists in this book um, was really uh, looking for a second chance. The only one who was doing well was Don Shula, who's in the book too, because he actually had a perfect season that year, but uh, everyone else uh, needed help. Um, and so into this mix uh, falls the Posner family, Sophie, uh, Jacob, and their 12-year-old son, Adam. Uh, for those of you who've been following along at home, if you've read Elijah Visible, they were the Posners, they're back 20 years later. Um, and uh, and um, they are uh, damaged Holocaust survivors. Um, Sophie, interestingly, becomes the um, uh, the consigliere for Meyer Lansky's Jewish Mafia. And she's actually known throughout town as uh, Lansky's Lady Consigliere. You know, the the what she learned in the camps prove invaluable for organized crime. Uh, and the husband, uh, Jacob, is sort of um, a broken, very muted man who's very much lost in his misery uh, because he's lost so much. And neither of the parents are, are parenting their 12-year-old son, Adam, 
who is also doing his best efforts to uh, escape from them. Um, and so uh, Miami Beach and Upper West Side, by the way, uh, they have some things in common. You know, it's not so hard to do a reading here, uh, specifically here. I mean, the main thing they have in common is Jews. Uh, there are Jews in both locations. Miami Beach had Jews with tans, but they're still Jews. Uh, by, by the way, Mark Golub and the JBS wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Jews in this novel, because if this was a novel with Italians and Canarsie, that's just not their demographic. Um, uh, but uh, uh, it's not just Jews that they have in common. They also had Isaac Bezheva Singer in common. Um, three blocks, three or two blocks that way, between a two blocks between uh, Broadway and Amsterdam, is Isaac Bezheva Singer Boulevard. And on 95th Street, in what's known as Surfside, but it's the northern tip of Miami Beach and 95th Street, it's called uh, uh, Isaac Bashev Singer Way. Um, yes, so both this area and Miami Beach shared Singer. And so uh, in honor of that, and because we're in a bookstore, uh, I thought we would, I would do a section from this uh, section in which Singer appears. What I be found, what I be found in Miami Beach was a bounty of awkward mating habits, vapid vanities, moral mishaps, common corruptions, foul infidelities, and the most loosely gripped hold on sanity anywhere in the Jewish world. Miami Beach was a mental hospital for Jews, where everyone walked freely, although their minds were securely restrained in straitjackets. I.B. wasn't in Surfside to retire, but to follow leads and scope out the action. The vestiges of European Jewish life was fast succumbing to the obsolescence of a dead language in an America that demanded total immersion. They were his landsmen, but he took no pity in presenting them to the Gentile world in the bleakest and most unflattering of lights. You, you can't hide from evil in the world by walking around Miami Beach like a sunburned ghost, Jacob, uh, I.B. said as he brushed the bowl holding the baked apple aside. Sunshine doesn't make problems go away. What, sunshine? Jacob said. What sunshine? Uh, where is he? Uh, you think I see sunshine? All I see are black clouds filled with smoke floating above Miami Beach. The rest of my family is up there, I.B., the wife and the child I had before Sophie and Adam. That is a ghost town with everyone. This is a gross town with everyone dressed in white. My picture of Miami Beach is not suitable as a postcard. Maybe Jackie Gleason was taken off TV because people up north began to see what I see and didn't want to come on down after all. Nightmares, I be asked although he was quite sure of the answer. Still, they haunt you. Yes, of course. And the heart, your condition? I take nitroglycerin tra tablets like no tomorrow. And sometimes I wish there was no tomorrow. And with that, he popped another into his mouth, allowing it to dissolve under his tongue before searching for the water he feared the waiter had already taken away. You know, I've been a vegetarian all these years, I.B. said, telling Jacob something that was already well known. And when people ask me why I eat no meat or poultry, I tell them that I do it for the health of the chickens. But I also know that I will probably live longer because I eat healthier than these Americans. <laughs> you think my problems are from food? Jacob chuckled at the thought that something as mundane as eggs, butter, and sirloin could have sidelined him with three prior heart attacks. My diet is fine. My cholesterol is low. I exercise. Yes, slowly, but I exercise. What's not fine is my head and my memory, which at night brings me nightmares almost as bad as the real thing. They never list nightmares as a cause of death, you know. But I'm sure that when I die, that's what the coroner will say. You don't need a heart condition to have a heart that is broken. I.B. hurriedly sip, sipped his cup of hot tea through a sugar cube gripped by his front teeth like a bit in a horse's mouth. 
This, too, is an artifact of the fall in Europe. He then licked his pen as if it were a vegetarian meal and recorded what Jacob had just told him. Cause of death? Nightmares. I still can't believe it was six million, Jacob said. You know, that's the number they're saying. That's the number they're saying. Your family, all of my family, all of those families that the world will never know. I lost my wife, my first wife, and she was pregnant with a second child, an unborn child the Nazis took from me. When my son speaks to me at night, all I hear is, Tata, was the second one a boy or a girl? Does it matter? I don't know. Even my dreams won't tell me. Jacob paused, his eyes moistened, and, and he waited, perhaps for that child's voice to reveal itself in Surfside in a whisper. They say that we survivors should carry on normal lives. The past must not destroy the future. Do not allow the Nazis to have the ultimate victory. So we start new families. We buy a station wagon, take the children to Little League games, and after that, we treat them to ice cream. We go see the circus. Clowns make everyone laugh, and it's important to learn to laugh again. Join the PTA. The PTA! Little League? I'm sorry. We Posners cannot do such things. All right. I mean, look, I could have, I could have read you the hilarious stuff, <laughs> but I thought you could take this. I, I killed in, my, in Miami last week, but I did, I did the dirty stuff. I did dirty material that they loved, believe me. Right? Bubble, I, I, I did. I, you want the dirty stuff here? Yeah. <laughs> So I thought, you know, out of respect to Singer's old neighborhood, we, we would do a little homage to Isaac Singer and the role that he played in the family of the Posners as a confessor, confidant, the only man who Jacob Posner would speak to. And 20 years ago, I wrote Elijah Visible with the Posners, but it was a very postmodern tale in which there were nine portraits of Adam Posner at different levels. So he's an adult. But they, all the stories collided against each other. Some stories he had long hair and he wore a motorcycle and he was an abstract painter. In another story he had no hair and he couldn't ride a bicycle and he taught Holocaust literature at Hunter College. Uh, and so he was a child in some stories and it really moved back and forth, fracturing time. Uh, and the reviews, I noted that two of the reviews said that Adam Posner in Miami Beach as a boy were the most interesting stories. And not that I really care what a reviewer thinks, but I thought that was an interesting idea, that maybe it said, I, as Adam Posner, he was in the, in, the, uh, in the stories, he was 12, like he is here, as an observer of the events around him, he was more interesting than as a character himself. Um, and I, you know, I took that seriously. I thought, well, maybe you know, it's time to revisit Adam in Miami Beach. The other thing that happened was that, um, you know, I've always, I was 12 years old when all of this happened, the conventions, you know, there was the scene that I read in Miami Beach is literally an orgy scene in a park because the hippies, the counterculture actually came to Miami Beach to protest the war and they, 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 they took, they, they occupied a park that was given to them to camp out, to smoke dope, to go skinny dipping at night as long as they didn't hassle the delegates, that's true. And that's how, that's actually how the city of Miami Beach avoided the riots of Chicago four years earlier. It was actually a brilliant strategy that the police chief had, which he said, look, I only have 200 cops. I cannot police you. You're a bunch of lunatics. Take the park. You can, you can have orgies in there. You smoke pot. I don't care. I won't make any arrests. You can even use the pool at midnight throughout the night. Don't hassle delegates. And he actually, you know, they actually put a podium away from the convention center. So, you know, the, there is... Uh, there's, there, a lot was going on, but when I was 12, I didn't know there were orgies in the park. Uh, I would have liked to know. I would, I, but I would have been the first person down there had someone said there's orgies in the park. Uh, but I found this out years later. I went, what? Uh, and th I started to think about all the things that my happen was happening in Miami Beach in 1972. It was all there. Like it was this little pipsqueak town. But Sinatra was there lamenting his career. Jackie Gleason was there essentially dying of various ailments from his weight uh, and, w you know, lamenting lo losing his, uh, uh, you know, his TV show. Muhammad Ali was training on Fifth Street and running on the beach. 
Uh, you know, people have very casual memories of Ali at that time. People, there's some Miami Beach people here. One person's wearing a hat. Can he find? Um, um, so, you know, this was all happening. The Jewish mafia was so casually embedded in Miami Beach that everyone had a Meyer Lansky story. Like, everyone did something with Meyer Lansky. No one ever thought it was embarrassing to admit that we knew mobsters. We never, never occurred to anybody. In Miami Beach, it was ubiquitous that the Jewish mob was at the end of their day and everybody's father was doing something bad. Um, and, and so, um, I, as years gone on, I knew there was a novel in that year. I knew something was in that year. And, I, and then what happened was I was asked to interview E.L. Doctorow for a documentary. And in doing so, um, I, uh, I reread all of his books and I reread Ragtime, which I had read years early and always loved. And in rereading Ragtime, I, it dawned on me. I had, I had my novel. I realized this is exactly what I want to do, uh, that Miami Beach was its own Ragtime of 1972, and all these historical characters were there. And just like if you remember Ragtime, there was father, mother, boy. This is the same thing. It's the Posner, Posner boy. And they're pivoting around. The book is really about the city and the characters. The, the family is sort of there to sort of connect all of the characters somehow together. Because uh, it wasn't a really great way to connect Isaac Singer to Jackie Gleason. And also, I think the, you know, the anniversary, I mean, I wasn't kidding. You know, I said, well, I've been here nine times, and I'll keep coming back until I get it right. You know, I, I started to feel like, God, I've been doing this for 20 years. Like, I'd not, you know, I had not done anything for 20 years. You know, I was very itinerant in everything I do. This is the one thing I've done for that long a time. So I got nostalgic, and I thought back to Elijah Visible and said, you know, I'm not really done with that family, and let me do something more. Because uh, they were just, you know, there was just glimmers of that stuff in the first book. People always say, are you the characters in your books? And I always say, my agent, Ellen Levine, would wish, you know, Alava that it was me. Because you write a memoir about some psycho you know, and you get on Oprah. Uh, you know, you write a novel about a psycho, nobody cares. So if, I, if, if this stuff that happens to Adam Posner had happened to me, I'd have a very different career. Uh, so, uh, no, it is fiction. I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a nonfiction writer in that way. The nonfiction writing I do, as Sam Friedman knows, is more argument-based. I don't really tell stories in a, you know, in a nonfiction way. I mean, I wouldn't have known how to even do that. So... Number one. Number two, you know, honestly, I would not have known how to connect the characters if I didn't create a fictional family. Uh, they really, it's, the characters really had nothing, you know, when I spoke to the son of the police chief, um, you know, Jimmy Pomerantz, he's now on TV, uh, and he said, look, he, I said, did your father know Meyer Lansky? He was the leading hood, and your father was the leading cop. How much did they know? And the son said to me, I don't even think they met. And I said, that can't be. Right? And he said, no, I have no memory of him saying that he hung out with the, you know, a, a mafia chieftain, chieftain. So he may have, yes, he might, I'm sure it happened. But the point is, I needed to find a way to connect all of them, including Fidel Castro. And the only way to do this is to find a family as the connective tissue. In 1972, I know this is hard to believe, because everyone, what is it, the Jackie, Me <laughs> Jackie Gleason line? No, Jackie Mason line, right? Every Jew has a story of a building that he wanted to buy, but another Jew talked him out of it. <laughs> That's Miami Beach, because we could have owned the world if someone had a brain in those days. They were literally giving away all those Art Deco hotels. Nobody was living in them. So it was really in, and in fact, a few years later, uh, you know, the movie Scarface picks up on it again. It got worse. Um, so the idea that the revival of Miami Beach is stunning, I think, for anyone who grew up there, right? We can't even imagine. We go down there. And it's unbelievable what they did to it. So in a way, it's spectacular and beautiful. And I just did an event there. I'm going to do a couple more events. So I'm very grateful for that. But it is, they've reached their 100th birthday, actually. Miami Beach this year is 100 years old. And, uh, and this book is a snapshot of a time that is long gone. This was a time where people believed that unless gambling came to Miami Beach, the city would just go bankrupt. There was no thought that it would survive. Tourism dried up. Tourists were going elsewhere at that point. They were taking trips to Europe. Nobody was coming to visit their grandparents and staying in the Eden Rock. The hotels were absolutely empty throughout my entire childhood. I mean, literally, nobody was staying in them. So they've cleaned it up. But on the other hand, you know, just like the Upper West Side, sorry to say this, and the Lower East Side for sure, uh, you know, it lost its, you know, its, its true Jewish European essence. 
It may still have Jews, but the essence of what it once was has is evaporated, it doesn't exist. And people who have lived on the Upper West Side for decades know what we're talking about. There's an enormous change. I mean, I don't know. I, look, I think Singer would have loved Victoria's Secret. You know, just... <laughs> I'm just guessing. That he would have liked. The rest he could have done without. I'll tell you what he could have done without. There are just no bookstores. You know, when my book came out 20 years ago, there were bookstores all along Broadway and Columbus. I mean, this is really a, a cultural tragedy. And that, that existed, and that just doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Oh, yes, Sandy Borowski, the book critic of The Jewish Week. Maybe you said this earlier, but have you met Singer? Did you meet him in... Oh, you're, that's a setup. Uh, yeah, I did. I met him once. I was, um, I, with, I was with some friends who didn't know who he was, and I was at Pumpernick's restaurant. This is a true story, actually. I was at Pumpernick's restaurant, and I went over to talk to him, and he, he um, oh, it was very sweet. He was with his wife, and he was eating a baked apple, because he only ate, he only ate, that's how I got that. I knew exactly what he ate. He ate a baked apple. And he was sitting there by himself, and it was late. I think it was like after, after a football game or something. I can't remember. It was really late. I don't know what he was doing there. And I walk up to him, and I say, you know, you're Isaac Singer. You know, I've read some of your stories. My parents have. And this probably never happened to him in Miami Beach. So he didn't look up from his baked apple. And I was sort of talking nervously to him. I remembered. I was a kid. And then he looks at me. He finally looks up, and he says, you got a car? That's what he said. That was, the, that was what he said. You got a car? And I said, yeah, I got a car. I mean, I was 17 years old or something. And <laughs> I excused myself from the restaurant. I drove him back to his apartment from, six, from 69th Street to 95th Street. And he didn't say anything in the car. And I remember I was talking. You know, I might want to write someday. You know? <laughs> I mean, I was always looking for mentors. <laughs> I was always looking for some father to show up and do something. Uh, so I figured, take a shot with Singer. Uh, and he didn't, he didn't care. Uh, he got out of the car, no tip, nothing. <laughs> I said, bye, Mr. Singer. Bye, Mrs. Singer. Bye, bye. And so Sandy Borowski knows that story and loves that story. And I would have forgotten to say that story. The restaurants are in the, the, restaurants are in the book because the restaurants were unbelievable, but they were like a, you know, <laughs> Dr. Jonathan Sackner, who is a cardiologist, knows they were like set up for his career. And in fact, there's a joke, there's a running joke throughout the book that the cardiologists were just laughing themselves silly in Miami Beach because they said, this is the best city to be a cardiologist. Everyone's dying of this one problem, eating. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I put the vegetarian thing because he really was an anomaly. Who goes to Pumpernick's and has a baked apple? Like, it's crazy. Like, he was the only person trying to find vegetarian food on Collins Avenue. There wasn't, there wasn't such, there was not, you didn't even, you, there was not, like, no one knew what a broccoli was, like, in, in 72. That no one knew what it was. So. It disappeared, like the whole, that whole, um, you know, for those of us who lived, Joey Feshback always says, my friend, we grew up together, he says he tells his friends, no, wherever he is, he tells, tries to tell them about what it was like to grow up in Miami Beach in that era. And he says, nobody believes me. He says, nobody believes me because he says to them, it was paradise. And I must say, when I told people in Miami, right, Bubba, last week, everyone applauded because everyone in the room who was there, they knew that you were right, that they, they remembered it so fondly. And yet the city was falling apart. It had no infrastructure. It had no economy. You know, it had nothing. But it really was, as you're right, Joey, it was very much paradise. And that, when you think of Miami Beach today, with, it, with all of its, you know, glamour and glitz, it's really quite extraordinary. But the one that we remember is a Miami Beach filled with snowbirds, retirees, Holocaust survivors, Cuban exiles. It was an incredible stew of, uh, you know, American immigration immersion. I mean, it was really astonishing. I mean, so many of the people in Miami Beach didn't speak English. They either spoke Yiddish or they spoke Q Spanish. I mean, it was just, it, everyone was figuring out how to re-enter life in America. The Cubans and certainly many of the Holocaust survivors, which were as a huge number, you know, this idea of the Posners living in Miami Beach was not unusual. There's a huge number of survivor communities living there. And that's one of the reasons why Miami Beach has that really wonderful uh, Holocaust uh, 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 sculpture. Uh, yes, Mars, go ahead. So Singer uh, also began going to Israel later in life. 
let me say that I'm going to start a little louder. He said, Mar said that Israel about this time was also starting to go to Israel. Oh, Singer went to go to, began going to Israel where he had a rapprochement with his son. Oh, he did. And he, and he said he went to Miami and he went to Israel because that's where his readers were. Because that's where his readers were. Right. Yeah. Israel plays into the novel, too. I'm glad that Morris brought that up because um, Lansky, uh, in 1972, Lansky gets exiled, extradited from Israel back to Miami Beach. People don't realize this. This is actually captured in Godfather 2. <laughs> if you just want to know, it's actually in, they do it differently. He doesn't get shot, mur assassinated in the Miami International Airport. But he actually, the is, uh, you know, uh, he takes the law of return seriously. He goes to Israel and he says, I'm now a citizen. And the, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office in uh, Florida uh, file extradition papers to the Israelis. Remember, Israel is a very new country, young country, in 1972. I don't know what they would have done today. But in 1972, with all of the, you know, with all of the aid that was coming from the United States, I think they wanted to say, he's one of us, and he belongs here, and he's a crook, but he's our crook. Um, but I think that they weren't able to do it. And I think he was very surprised. He lawyered up. He lawyered up for like a year and a half. And he took it all the way to the Supreme Court of Israel and he lost. And then he was extradited back to Miami. Now, in The Godfather 2, they do it very, you know, they do it really wonderfully where he gets assassinated. But that's not what happened. He actually comes to Miami Beach. Of course, the Jewish gangsters were always welcome in Miami Beach. <laughs> you know, there was no Corleone family. They came in and he went back to the Imperial House and had breakfast at Wolfie's and, and hung out and tried to remake the Jewish mafia. But they were so old at this point and, you know, basically irrelevant. And there was some thought... This is why they were the ones that spearheaded the referendum to make uh, Miami Beach a gambling casinos, because they thought that was the only way to save the city. And as you now know, we all know from the Northeast, it wasn't Miami Beach that got the casinos, it was Atlantic City. And for all of the futzing around back and forth and the failure of the Floridians to actually f uh, pass any of those referendum, which would have br put Lansky back in business. Uh, and when that happened, you know, it was over, went to Atlantic City and it, everything passed him by and he died. Uh, so Israel plays a role there too. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.